Welcome back from lunch. We are so glad that you have chosen to join us this afternoon. And welcome to Endodontics Reimagined Genowave Procedure Workflow Efficiency with Dr. Kirk Corey. A quick reminder, look down at the bottom of your screen. There is a four digit code currently. You're gonna wanna jot this down. And at the end of the session, you'll pair that with the last four digits. That makes an eight digit CE code that you're gonna need for your CE survey. And so without further ado, I'm gonna turn over to Dr. Kirk Corey. All right, everyone hears me okay? Excellent, thanks Bryn. And I wanna thank the rest of the Sonendo and TDO team for the opportunity to be here. Uh, just happy to get out of town and to see live faces. The Zoom, uh, the Zoom conversations have been fun for just a little bit, but uh, it's really nice to see some, some faces here. So um, I want to jump right into this. Those of you who know me know that I'm ra rarely at a loss of words, so I've got a lot to cover, and uh, so we'll get started right away. Just the typical disclaimer everyone has seen, I'm a KOL for Sonendo, and these opinions are my opinions, and, and uh, cases are my cases if I'm showing any of these. So I have to start by saying what happened to me on the plane the other day. Coming in on Wednesday, and a, a lady next to me asked me what I did, and I said, I'm an endodontist. She didn't really say anything, so I assumed she knew what that meant. And uh, she said, well, my husband has a terrible abscess, and he's going to have to have it drained tomorrow. And I said, oh, wow. And she goes, and then he has to go back a week later and have it drained again. I'm thinking, that's odd. So I thought, and I said, well, we use this amazing technology. It's called Gentle Wave. It's, uses sound waves and fluid dynamics and these little you know bubbles are created and it takes the abscess out and rarely do we have to do that twice and she sat there for a second and then i said well who is he seeing by any chance i mean she was from this area and she said i don't know some butt doctor at the colonoscopy clinic and i'm thinking <laughs> it shows what can happen when uh, we're not on the same page? And sometimes I feel that way when I'm talking to people who have just invested in Genowave. Sometimes we're talking about the same thing, but we're really not because they haven't fully, you know, they ha haven't fully bought into the use of the procedure and allow that use of the, or allow the procedure to do what it really can do in your practice. So we get that out of the way. So I wanna begin the conversation today uh, by discussing the why, the why behind our decision to invest in Gentle Wave. And this is gonna vary from clinician to clinician, no question. Then I'll help you to create a culture shift. And that culture shift is gonna center around Gentle Wave. And it's gonna resonate not only with you and the team, but it'll also resonate with your patients and your referring doctors. And then we'll outline some specific procedures and strategies that'll optimize efficiency. Um, and that means we have to co coordinate the roles of the team so they perform consistently, which in turn allows us to perform consistently. And then we'll round out our time together uh, discussing procedural workflow that will help establish reproducible results and help us to be as efficient as we can possibly be without sacrificing quality. As we navigate through these objectives, I want you to open your mind, I want you to open your eyes, so that we can look at things through a different set of lens, so to speak. And hopefully it'll challenge us to let go of some of our legacy concepts and thoughts and opinions and to think about not only what's possible with this technology, but to really and completely immerse ourselves into becoming a gentle wave practice. That way we can reimagine endodontics in a totally different way. And with Gentle Wave, there's a lot of moving parts um, from understanding and appreciating the mechanism of action. We heard Merzad talk about that yesterday, evolving into minimal to even no instrumentation or the, the NIE that we're starting to talk about. And as a result, then we begin to operate smaller spaces. But there's that additional important aspect of incorporating this technology into our busy practices that we really don't spend a whole lot, a lot of time talking about until now. Now I'm gonna make a few assumptions. I'm gonna assume that everyone um, that's viewing this has Gentle Wave. 
Um, and I'm going to, or at least most of you, hopefully there's a few that don't, and um, you're going to get some really good information. I'm also going to assume that you have it because you believe that it enhances your ability to clean canals better than anything that we have available to us today. I'm also going to assume that we have a wide range of users. Some of you use it only occasionally. Some of you are going to use it all in all the time like we do, and then there'll be everyone in between. So wherever you are, my goal for you today is to inspire you to take it to the next level, whatever that next level is. This is one of my favorite graphics and probably y'all's too, and it's a reminder of what we do as endodontists on a daily basis. Um, we make our work seem easy, and it's easy on the surface, but there's so much more to it that goes on underneath the, the, the water. And you know, the more that meets the eye, we, we, whether we're building a practice, we're growing the practice, we're creating that wow experience for our patients, or if we're cultivating our referral relationships or trying to build them and maintain them, or bringing on a new technology just like this that's, uh, you know, it, it changes the way we do things. It's disruptive. What people see versus what, it act, what actually is taking place to get there is quite a contrast. So why Gentle Wave? Why did we invest in the technology and more so now that we have it, what are we going to do with it? Let's think about the why from a clinical and historical perspective. As far back as 1917, we're all aware of Dr. Hess and his unbelievable work of showing us what really resides in the teeth. I like to call it the enemy within. And even then, he said it was a system that cannot be cleaned by instruments alone. And then we propel ourselves more than 100 years later in 20 plus file designs, and we're still trying to figure out this ballgame. So it begs the question, how can we improve? How much debris is acceptable to leave inside the root canal? We know that a lot of studies suggest anywhere from 20 to 30 percent after conventional instrumentation and irrigation is left behind. We all agree that our treatment enjoys a very good success rate. And I've never met an endodontist to this day that didn't want a cleaner canal. So can we do better? The piece to the missing puzzle for us for Amarillo Endo was Gentle Wave, and this was far from a knee-jerk reaction, a knee-jerk decision um, in deciding to bring it on board. We spent several years uh, acquainting ourselves with the technology, first as critics, and then I come to you today as a raving fan. Yet, we've always considered, our, considered ourselves early adopters of worthy technology, but never for the sake of technology without asking ourselves a few questions. Is it safe and effective for our patients? Does it enable us to deliver elevated level of care for our patients? Will we be more efficient? Are we going to be more productive? I've been practicing for almost 30 years in December. It's hard to believe it's gone by so fast. And Jim, my partner, has been at it almost 25 years. In fact, I'm happy to say we're going to celebrate our 25th anniversary. Uh, this next June, and um, I want to share with you a little memento we had to commemorate our 20th anniversary. And I hope that those of you who are in partnerships um, share as many laughs as we've had over the years. Who knows what we're going to come up with uh, for number 25, but I digress. Let's get back to Gentle Wave. Only in the last two and a half years have we used this technology. If you'd have told me two and a half, two and three quarters years ago, I'd be standing here telling you. Uh, how awesome this technology is, uh, I'd tell you, you're full of it. But at this point in our careers when we decided to bring it on, we certainly didn't need to do it um, to grow our practice. Matter of fact, a lot of people thought we were fairly crazy for doing it because they had told us it might disrupt your practice in a way you're not going to really like. But when we saw firsthand what it did inside the root canals, we knew we had to bring it on board. And you know what? We've never looked back, and here we are two years and 5,000 plus patients later, and we're both having the time of our lives uh, doing what we love, and that's endodontics, and, but it's just in a reimagined kind of way. And guess what else? We're more profitable because of it. It's grown our practice organically because of what this technology does and is, and it can do the same thing for you guys if you let it. So in terms of productivity and the bottom line, We've all heard of ROI, return on investment. 
This is typically tangible. There are metrics that you can quantify the return. It involves cost with reward and a certain amount of risk. And it can vary from practice to practice and individuals within the practice. When we decided to invest in GentleWave, um, we honestly did so without any consideration of what it would bring to our bottom line. We did so because of what it did, its efficacy and the benefits others were witnessing firsthand in their practices. So along with ROI, there are other metrics that bring value to the investment as well. On the other side of this line is the VOI, or the value on investment. And this involves the intangible things, the things that you know contribute to performance but can't necessarily be measured. Like, what is our why? What is our good enough? Um, how does it enhance patient outcomes? Or what benefits, other than financial, does it bring to the bottom line? Surprisingly, I, I'm happy to tell you that we have noticed not only an ROI, but a VOI as the value of GentleWave has enhanced our practice. So that we can begin to develop a culture around GentleWave, the very first thing that we have to do as leaders is to communicate our vision so that our team will fully understand the benefits of the technology, which will ultimately lead to total team buy-in. As with anything, there's an easy way and there's a hard way to do things. It's much easier to reimagine endodontics with GentleWave if we don't have a fixed mindset. If we believe that everything is carved in stone, it can be pretty tough to adopt and embrace change, even if it potentially improves outcomes and performances. Yet, if we have a, a, a growth mindset, it requires us to be open to growth and change, and it's a conscious effort, so it's a little bit more difficult to implement. But this mindset is constantly evolving and knows no boundaries. It's perfect for GentleWave, because GentleWave is constantly evolving. And quite honestly, I think we're at the tip of the iceberg. Uh, it knows no boundaries either. So with the growth mindset, we can easily move from through the zones beyond the comfort zone where we can find a sense of accomplishment, we can find a sense of uh, confidence in that rejuvenated spirit. I have, to, I have to be honest, I mean, this presentation tested me. I told Bryn about it. I quickly discovered that I was way out of my comfort zone. I thought I knew everything. Uh, I'm used to talking about clinical aspects of, of the gentle wave and um, I, yeah, I came up with a lot of the ideas and I can convey those ideas to my team but, and they implement them. And so I had, no idea, I had no idea how all this stuff really worked down below the surface of the water. So when I began breaking this down into steps, man, I realized I didn't know anything at all. It was a lot, lot, lot like going into your office on a Saturday morning to see a patient. You're banging the door, drawers closed looking for anesthetics. And you know what we're talking about, Vic. Um, it was, it was tough, and I, but the cool part is I learned a lot about my team, and I learned that they have a vision that we helped create, but we only spoke it. They took it, and they created something pretty incredible. And then when we asked for them to do shifts in that culture, they were able to implement it without us even thinking there was any problem because everything was happening below the surface of that iceberg. So I'm blessed and pretty much in awe of them. So we knew that if we wanted to create this solid ethos or philosophy around the gentle way, we would have to include them in the decision-making process early on. And that started long before that first console ever arrived. To effectively communicate our vision, it starts with us, starts with the doctors, and we have to lead by example so we can communicate everything that we believe to be true about the technology because it's a big investment. It's a big deal to bring it on. I mean, if you're going to bring it on and not even use it, well, quite honestly, I think that's kind of silly. And like everything we do, it's centered around the patient. GentleWave is no different. Through our vision sharing, we could, they could sense our enthusiasm, and that empowered them then to gain a new level of understanding about the procedure and understand a different level of the science behind it. And that created this cohesiveness and a team buy-in that ultimately ensures efficiency, it ensures synergy, less frustration as we progress through that initial phase of the learning process. 
we also knew that you had to be persistently consistent when going through this learning phase. And why? We knew it's going to be difficult because you have to let go of those old ways of doing things. So we knew we had to be full on commitment to using the technology on every single patient that we could. Why would you limit Gentle Wave to certain patients or to certain clinical situations? And just like any new technology, Gentle Wave's no different. Practice makes progress, and it's literally, it's a crawl, walk, run experience. Once we had the team on board and excited about the journey we were about to take, then we had to be flexible and we had to be patient with one another and have patient with the process uh, because we were all gonna go through this learning phase together. So gaining efficiency in our treatments is all about experience. The more we do, the better we get. And uh, it's also about team coordination, um, timing, you know, being patient with, with not one another, having expectations that are aligned. We all have to roll the boat, row the boat in the same direction. One of the questions for, from one of our team members came, she said, how, are we, how can we possibly be more efficient? You always tell us we're a well-oiled machine. I mean, she put her hand on her hip. And she said, you can't put another drop of oil in this tank. And you know, it, how do you respond to that? So we did what, it, what any good leader does. We looked up the word efficiency and put it on the whiteboard. And, Here's what it said, it's improving workflow efficiency will help us complete more work in less time and standardize how the work is performed without compromising quality. Well, they didn't really like the work, more work in less time part, but the reality is it doesn't have to be more work in less time. It could just be less time to do your work better. So it doesn't necessarily mean more work, but it could. Depends on how you look at it. So if we translate, translate that into our general wave practice, we were hoping to become more efficient by completing more cases in a single visit. And by trusting the technology, we can reduce our instrument usage. <clears throat> and by doing that, we will instrument less and thereby preserving as closely as possible the original canal anatomy. And you save a little bit of time. And because it's widely known that gentle wave patients are experiencing less post-operative pain across the board, so not having patients return for those post-operative issues that can occur, that opens up our schedule for more, for more new opportunities. Here's that ROI, VOI thing creeping back in again. And because this is an evolutionary experience and success takes a little work, takes commitment, it takes persistence with a dash of setbacks. You throw in a few failures. We had to relearn a lot of things, and that's uncomfortable. But being uncomfortable is how we grow and get better. It's just a universal principle. For example, here's one. Just sitting for seven to eight minutes, letting that gentle wave do its work was difficult. It, it, we're doers. We're tasked. I mean, we want to be passing instruments. We want to be doing something that we feel that's advance, advancing us to the next step. We didn't appreciate how sound seal really worked. We tried to scrimp on it, thinking we'll save a few pennies here and there. We didn't really realize that the tooth has to be carefully and thoughtfully cocooned, and it has to really prevent leakage of anything whatsoever to ensure an uneventful gentle wave experience, not only for the patient, but for us as well. Or how hard it would be to let go of some of those legacy ideas like instrumenting to larger sizes or eventually obturating the small spaces. Persistence paid off, and because of our already established culture and the way we approach the technology from the very beginning, we were able to go from crawling to sprinting in no time at all. We began our coordination efforts with the front office. It's an obvious place to start. This is where the initial patient and referral contact takes place. It's where first impressions are made. Whenever possible, we want to speak to the patient directly, even though the general dentist may refer them over. Um, there's a number of obvious reasons, but the main thing is, is we want to ask them specific questions about their situation. We want to assess their expectations, and so we can then be, be best prepared for their visit in our office. We take this opportunity, and this is new with Gentle Wave, we take the opportunity to share our philosophy of care using the technology and why we believe it's better, what they can expect during our, our visit, uh, their visit with us. and. If they want to learn more, we can direct them to our website or to the Gentle Wave website for more information. And of course, the scheduling of our patients takes place here. And we know that this is no small task in an endodontic office. It's a, it's a moving target. 
Rarely does our afternoon look like the morning. Um, and I don't, it's just crazy how that happens, but it's, 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 in, it's a fact. So if we're talking about the schedule, I'd like to share with you just the day in the life of a pre gentle wave schedule in our office. Um, the left side, two columns are mine, the right two columns are Jim's. The center column at the time was our checks and evaluations and consults and what have you. And our fifth, we have six ops, but it had the cone beam at the time. So we were predominantly 80 to 85% uh, single visit. Saw five to six patients a day. Um, we had three to five post-op checks per week per doctor. That was pretty customary. Uh, we would tell the patients to anticipate post-op discomfort. We'd give them their little care package with Motrin and told them it would probably last up to two weeks. We have an open door policy. If they want to come back to see us and they want us to check it, we want them to do that, and that exists today. Um, there's that occasional need for being our worst critic and saying we need to retreat our case, or sometimes we have to do surgery on our own case. So let's take a little bit closer look at this. The gray that you see those are second visit appointments. So in this particular day, there's six of those. And the orange are check appointments. So we signed, allotted about 40 minutes per file and complete, we call it. And so in this day, there were four hours. And we gave the check appointments 15 minutes each, so there were roughly 30 minutes. So we had four and a half hours. So let's contrast that to a post gentle wave day. Because we increased our number of single visits to 98%, we were able to capitalize on some of these opportunities that the pre-gentle wave schedule wouldn't allow us to do. So where this technology really shines is if you're predominantly a, a two-visit practice, Marcus, it changes everything. And you trust the technology as you go. So you have a 30, 40, 50% swing to single visit. That's ROI. So if we take those four and a half hours of time, and, and that can be available production or just available opportunity, that's an increase to the bottom line of four and a half X. That X is whatever you want it to be. We can optimize our schedule now that we don't have all these distractions and wasteful second visits. We can add a new appointment. We can add, start to finish an emergency. This was especially true during COVID. Gentle Wave was indispensable. We were able to predictably take the patients out of pain. We could do it in single visit so that they didn't have to return and subject themselves to another visit into an office that they might not have felt comfortable doing. So that was a big uh, value added service. You could add in another eval or consult or three or four if you want. Or you know what? Maybe it's just free time. It just frees up your schedule. Like John Cotomy said yesterday, he really doesn't want to see any more patients. It just gives you a little more freedom to call referrals or to do run errands or have a cup of coffee. If you don't think you have more time, you'll time yourself. As you gain proficiency with the gentle wave, time yourself for a couple of weeks and get you an average of what it takes to do the, tech, uh, the procedure. You'll be probably be fairly surprised how much available time you do have. Parkinson's law says that work expands to fill the time available. And so give it a try. You might be surprised. You might just organically be able to see an extra patient or two a day or not. It's totally up to you. But the important part is it gives you flexibility in your schedule. So as a result, I'd like to share with you that we saw an increase in procedures resulting in approximately a 14% increase in production compared to our pre gentle wave practice. And that happened incidentally, organically. We weren't all of a sudden going, okay, we gotta see more patients. It just happened because we had more time to do more things so we could move a consult into our uh, schedule. We have a unique demographics in Amarillo because our drawing area is so large. And so we might have patients that are driving 200 miles, so it's difficult to have them go home and have them come back. So we like to try to work them into the schedule. So this was a perfect way to do that. So if we take chair availability and the efficacy of the technology, throw in a positive patient experience, and oh, by the way, I didn't even talk to you about file savings. We had an 81.5% savings in file costs 
that resulted in the file company calling and wanted to know if Corey, I don't know why he picked on me, if Corey was retiring or, or if he was sick, you know, because it was just such a drastic drop. So if we add the tangible, you add the intangible benefits, you have a priceless technology. And it's priceless in a lot of ways, not only because it cleans canals better, but it makes you more productive if you let it. And it leaves you with, with this overwhelming sense of accomplishment, and then you just wonder how you practice without it. I was speaking to an endodontist just last week, and he had just got, the, got gentle wave two or three months, or a month or two ago, and he couldn't believe he waited three years to get it. And, and he, I quote, He's loving endo, I'm loving endo again after a mid-career lull, another common theme we see. Now we can drill down to the nitty-gritty of improving efficiency during patient treatment with the gentle wave, and we'll also share a few clinical tips that hopefully can make the gentle wave experience a little bit better. And please keep in mind, this is a collaborative effort from other gentle wave providers, and that's what's so cool about this is that we talk to one another, we're sharing clinical uh, tips, things that we encountered that, that helped our particular case. Um, we're always building each other up, and I think that's really something that we should be proud of. You'll know it's a clinical pearl when uh, the little icon does a little jiggle there. So defining workflow ensures efficiency. The take home really is when you run the same workflow, you should get the same results. And if you think about it, Gentle Wave, for the first time that I can think of in the history of endodontics, gives us a standardized treatment time of seven to eight minutes while it's doing its thing. So if we could standardize, standardize as much as possible the before and the after Gentle Wave, well, all of a sudden we be begin to establish a workflow efficiency that becomes very predictable and very reproducible, case after case after case. And saving the best for last, Here's the back office. This is the offensive front line. I mean, it's where blood, sweat, and tears are shed. We all know that. And so, uh, and if you guys don't have a Zania or a Christie in your office, then I encourage you to find one. Just obviously not ours, but Zania's on the right, Christie's on the left. And this is Christie doing what she does for every single patient. She's telling the patient, she's priming the unit, she's telling the patient what that patient's going to experience, why they're going to experience something different. And this is her. I can walk down the hall when she has a patient, and she's doing that exact same thing. So all of the treatment ops are ready. They're set up for Gentle Wave. Every patient gets a CBCT. I have a strong opinion that Gentle Wave should not be used without comb beam. And at the very minimum, I'm giving a little bit here, at the very minimum on all molars and all teeth that are approximating vital structures. The problem is we don't know where those are, all are, and, and we don't necessarily know the definition of vital structures just yet. We're, we're finding new and new th new, more new things on that all the time. We delegate the task of performing diagnostic tests to our assistants. I know some of you might not agree with that, but we do that, and there's a reason for it. We teach them what, when, why, and how to test. We teach them how to interpret the results. Uh, and this one thing, this one thing empowers them like you cannot believe. It sets them apart from every other assistant in dentistry and they know it. It's important. And then we'll come in, we'll verify the tests if we need to, rarely we do. Uh, and then we'll provide the treatment plan uh, and either reschedule or we're ready for showtime. This is our tray set, set up over the patient tray that we have. We, we have the, the side as well, but just like I have multiple anesthetic syringes so we don't have to repeatedly change cartridges, I have three sound seals ready to go with different tips uh, so that I can use a sound seal without having to change that out. Sorry, this is a little blurry than I, blurrier than I thought, but you'll see the three different tips. I use a little orientation dot on the matrix so that when the assistant hands that to me, I know exactly the direction it goes. I don't have to try to figure out where that little keyhole is. And then I have a sponge that I put in the access opening. And here are the, the different tips. You can see the micro tip for fine application of the sound seal. I've got the dento, uh, metal dental effuser tips. Uh, I, Ryan Facer taught me to take out the little uh, thread, so that becomes an applicator for boxes, and I can put it in undercuts. 
and then I have the macro tip for gross application. And I just learned yesterday from uh, Victoria and Dr. McClammy that they use the infuser tip with the yarn in there to clean off uh, with alcohol the tooth prior to placing the sound seal. So I'll be doing that on Monday. That's a great tip, and uh, I, I'm glad I got to throw that in. The first thing we do is we prime the system. Frequently during the priming, it makes a cool noise. It's a perfect time to tell the patient all about the procedure. It's working, you've got their attention, so start discussing what they're getting ready to go through. Next, we'll select the appropriate cycle based on the diagnosis. We'll always verbally communicate that so we're on the same page. And this graphic just shows the traditional uh, approach. We'll make the access, there's caries removal, we'll locate, locate the canals, get working length, uh, we'll go on to instrumentation, millimeter and a half to two millimeters short, followed by platform construction, gentle wave, and then we'll dry and obturate. As an example of this evolutionary process that occurs with gentle wave, um, and you got a hint of this yesterday if you're tuning in, in April, I was having a conversation with Dr. Facer in Salt Lake, and those of you who know Ryan, you know him to be an innovator. He's a forward thinker. Uh, he's always finding ways to do better and to be better. Uh, to me, he's kind of the epitome of endodontics reimagined. And he was de describing this variation to the, to the protocol that he had mindfully created, and it made total sense to me. Since then, I've been performing the procedure on all my cases to date, and here's the sequence. So, the canals are located and opened with the orifice shaper, but here's where everything changes. Uh, we build the platform, we go straight to the gentle wave. And what I'll show you here, this is, gen this is how Ryan does it. He'll go through the hypo cycle, he'll establish his working length perhaps, he'll get it with apex locator, he may get it with the comb beam, or he may just use some gutta percha points if the canal anatomy is, is in its natural state and looks good enough to not have to alter its shape whatsoever. And then he'll dry and obturate. I kind of decided early on I was going to go through the hypo cycle and then get my working link through the platform and uh, do minimal instrumentation or no instrumentation uh, depending on what the, what the uh, canal anatomy looked like. And then I would resume EDTA cycle and then dry and obturate. And I have to say, now I'm really leaning towards doing it more of Ryan's way just because I'm com becoming more comfortable. But there's some times that I choose to do, uh, do it in the middle. And what we're seeing with that, it's interesting. My assistant said, I think we're faster. I said, well, how are you faster? She goes, I don't know, it just feels faster. It's just that workflow thing. I don't think it's significant, but our workflow is faster because we're able to get through things and it just seems way more smooth. This is just an example of how you can obtain a working length with your polygonal measuring uh, uh, tool on, this is CareStream. So I'm not totally skilled enough to trust this, so I'll always have been backing it up. I know we've talked about that, Jimbo. Back it up with the Apex Locator, although I'm getting better and I'm anxious to learn more from uh, Cotomy and Facer uh, to give me a, just a little bit more skill in doing that. Um, so if we put this into context, it's just a shift of a few sequence of, of events that takes place um, with the gentle wave protocol. <clears throat> and very soon, our technique will evolve once again as Sonendo is doing what they do best, and that's innovating even better ways to clean canals. What's happening underneath the surface is not what we see up on top of the surface with this company. And after every gentle wave case, it's important to have a system in place and to have defined roles so that there's efficient console transition to the next patient. This takes place every patient. It takes place every time because it's in our DNA. Every patient will be treated with gentle wave unless otherwise uh, indicated by us. Never do we have an assistant ask us if the next patient is going to receive gentle wave. It just doesn't happen because it's not something that we do in our practice. Every patient's gonna get gentle wave. And I've heard doctors tell me, but my assistant you know, doesn't wanna do it because we're running behind. Or the assistants will tell me, yeah, but he's running behind, so I don't wanna do it. You can't do that. You remember when you, if you're, those of you who are in my era who had to go from film to digital radiography. When we did that, 
it was tough. Patients didn't like digital radiography. It was too easy to fall back. I had to take my developer machine, dump it in the trash, had to take all the film, dump it in the trash, and go cold turkey the other direction, or you just wouldn't do it. Gentle Wave's kind of that way. So here's a quick video, and I won't spend a lot of time with it, but this just shows the coordinated efforts. Um, you notice I like to hang the hose over my microscope. Works really well for me. Um, she takes it, Zania stands. And by the way, full disclosure, this is a reenactment. That's my assistant as a patient. So we donned, got rid of the PPE um, and decided to do this video real quickly. But she'll get things ready to go, puts it back into the uh, holster, and then Christy um, will come around and she hears it, she knows that it's time for her to come get the console and she'll get it ready for uh, the next patient. She'll replenish the fluids, she'll flush it, uh, get rid of the handpiece, get it cleaned up, and then she'll take it to the next, uh, next stop every single time. Boomer, sorry. Some of you Oklahoma guys don't know what that means. One of the more frequent questions I'll get a lot of times is um, ask me about the sound seal and the application. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail, but there are a few little pearls I'd like to share with you. So the important part of this is once this is mastered, it's commonly a one to three minute procedure depending on the level of complexity. So the goal, Jim Smith told me, the goal, the goal is to get to the platform as quickly as possible because from there, you're 20 to 30 minutes out. And that's, that's really, uh, uh, about true. So the minute I finish with my orifice opener, my assistant automatically hands me the alcohol cotton pellet. And Monday, it's gonna look a little bit different, but that's how it looks now. And she's ready to go. She doesn't ask me to wait. She doesn't wait for me to ask for it. It's ready to go after the, the, the orifice opener. Uh, and I personally like to add bonding. I just gives me that extra level of assurance that I'm not gonna have any leakage. I just do it's an extra five seconds, it's all. I don't ever want to have to replace a platform. It, it's a time killer. And the only reason I know that is because I had to replace a few platforms. And then we begin by placing the sound seal, starting as a gingival, running it circumferentially around the tooth and then curing it in layers. I did a little bench study. I took the depth gauges and I wrapped it with a little piece of, of uh, sticky note to the level of the depth gauge time and I filled each one of them up with sound seal and then I cured it for 10 seconds because that's what we do with the Ivoclar. Uh, and what I saw was anything past five millimeters what wasn't setting. Uh, now you could add more time and use a different light, but I'm just saying in the way we did it, we needed to do it five millimeters or less. And then we, she hands me the, uh, the matrix on locking, locking pliers or hemostat orientation dot is facing towards the handle. I can quickly go ahead and apply the sound seal, put it onto the tooth, and then begin to refine the access. And I threw this in here because I use cannulas, micro cannulas, uh, and I think you do the same thing, Karen. Use the micro cannulas for anterior and premolars because it's an excellent way to establish your straight line access. And you don't have to worry about diminishing the efficacy of your anterior premolar uh, PIs because this uh, will automatically allow you to know exactly where that straight line is. And then you can just build up the sound seal. And many times I just use a flat diamond disc, smooth off the top. I don't even use the matrix to add that other level of sound seal. So it works really well, it's very effective. And then we're ready to go. As Chris Granger says, the seal's a deal. And every time I do this procedure, I really do. I get a little bit tickled to think that I'm actually performing a root canal. I'm not irrigating the tooth. I'm doing the root canal procedure right now. The before is the access. The after is the filling of the canals. This is the root canal procedure with Gentle Wave. Okay, I'm going to spend the last few minutes um, sharing some tips that I've, I've learned from others and I want to share with you guys. So. We get lots of questions about patency, and this is one of those aha moments that occurs for every Gentle Wave user, and it usually happens kind of early in the game because we realize there are those cases where we have these piles of eights and tens with, you know, crinkled up tips, and then we couldn't get anywhere, so we go ahead and fill it, 
after we've run Gentle Wave, and then, oh my gosh, as Tom McClammy says, it's the thrill of the fill. And you had no idea that not only would you even get around that curve, but all the other stuff that's taken place in that apical third. So you, you, pretty soon you realize that the legacy concept of having to obtain patency is no longer necessary with Gentle Wave, and it's quite honestly pretty liberating. So, Dr. Limassani says, relinquish legacy concepts of patency files and filing to a certain size. Dr. Chopra, stop struggling with patency, just let the machine do its thing. This was learned organically from experience. My partner, Jim Douthat, when getting working length, no pre-curving of files, take what the canal gives you and move on. On to platform. Become proficient at platform building. Make sure to take into account deep margins where gingival bleeding can break your seal. Manage using hemostasis techniques, Dr. Limassani. What I like to do here too, if you have that, if your level of gingiva in the proximal box is above the cava surface, I like to take that down, get good hemostasis, and that creates a little trough for you to lay a, a bead of sound seal. It's just that added little benefit of no leakage um, during this procedure. Alcohol and over dry before the sound seal, interproximal drying a must. Layer a bead of sound seal, cure and check adherence with Explo Explore. That's uh, Steve Frost's recommendation. Matrix on a hemostast is a must for Dr. Hetz. Check that the matrix fits into access before initiating platform build. This is huge. If you don't, you just wasted a lot of sound seal because you gotta go back and it's just, a, it's just one less step that you wanna have to do. So always measure that before you uh, begin. Get to the platform building stage as soon as possible. Once I get to the platform, I'm 20, 30 minutes from case completion. And the, more importantly, as I begin a case, I'm constantly planning how I can ensure a good seal with a platform, especially on badly broken down teeth. And I didn't believe it at the beginning that sound seal could, could actually be used for badly broken down teeth, and it can, and it's so effective if you just do it properly. I find it better to clamp the tooth behind the one being treated for best access and isolation, it's Dr. Potter. Give, I love this, gentle wave is won or lost on the quality of the platform, period. Instrumentation, that's really about trusting the technology. When using rotary instruments, one pass and make gutta percha fit that shape. Let the technology work for you. Take what the tooth gives you and think of shaping as a means of accommodating obturation as opposed to one of cleaning. That's Mark Lemassani, and it's so true. It's everything we've been talking about all week, all weekend. When two canals converge, because he trusts the, con the, the, uh, the technology to do what it says it will do, consider instrumenting just one and going from there. Facer technique of going directly to gentle wave, then instrument, finish cycle, and fill. It's Dr. Palermo. It's all about replacing the job of the file with advanced fluid dynamics. Well, you know that's facer, and that is the way this is moving, isn't it? No instrumentation into Donics. Doesn't mean we're not gonna use an instrument, it just means we're gonna use the instrument to ensure fluid flow, not necessarily alter the shape of the canal, especially if the shape is natural. Comb beam, take comb beam on all patients. Dr. Palermo, viewer post-op calls, night and weekend calls are virtually non-existent. Sonia Chopra and pretty much every gentle wave user I know. Single visit, no more two visits. I used to be 50% two visit, now I'm 95% second visit. Uh, single visit, obvious, obvious benefit. Embrace the small spaces. Nothing changes in obturation other than everything is smaller, period. Communication between the doctor and the assistant during gentle wave to prepare for obturation. This is huge because, again, it's just that workflow. It's that seamless transition into the next step so that the case can be completed timely. Consider loops for the assistants or, or assistant binoculars on the scope so that the assistant is in the game with the clinician. All about just being part of the team. Okay, so in summary, here's my recipe for success. That growth mindset that we talked about earlier, without it, it's gonna be a little bit tough. 
And with it, your success in implementing Gentle Wave will be rewarding, and it's going to be fun for everybody involved. Allow yourself to trust the technology. Test it. See what it will do. Uh, start with a tooth that has some open canals and open shapes, and just try not instrumenting it. Let the Gentle Wave do the work. I mean, live a little. What, what's it going to do? You'll enjoy it. You'll be amazed what it does. So push the envelope just a little bit. It can be a relatively short learning curve if you make it part of your practice culture from the beginning. By communicating your vision and delegating the duties to the team, this will empower them. It will make them want to step up their game, and it's going to give them this ownership in the technology, and it works. Efficiency, it's really all about having your team being prepared for everything that happens, the next steps that are going to occur. And by defining their roles during and after treatment, then you minimize surprise and you maximize the efficiency and the fun again. And remember, you have to be persistently consistent, especially through that learning phase. It's very important. It means you and your team must commit yourselves to treating every single case that you can with Gentle Wave. And it all starts with a thorough application of the sound seal. Spend the time here to do it right because the seal really is a deal. And the only other missing ingredient here is you. You have to have the desire to do this. It's not going to happen if it's sitting over there gathering dust or you're just going to use it when convenient. You have to commit yourself to using this technology every single patient. It's pretty hard to argue the proven track record of safety and efficacy with over 450,000, 470,000 procedures performed to date, and that's a lot of teeth saved with Gentle Wave. And I think it's pretty safe to say that it's a game changer. It's a game changer for the endodontists, and it's a game changer for the patients that we serve. You know, we're, we're an incredible specialty made up of really talented people. Uh, we all know them. Um, and we're all committed to giving our patients our best every single day. Whether you use Gentle Wave or whether you don't, you know, we're in the game together. And I just say, if you haven't done so already, get rid of your biases and put away your subjectivities for a minute and assess the technology based on what the technology can do. You might be fairly surprised um, and then form your own opinion. There's no way you're going to walk away short of amazed. 700 of us can't be wrong. So where do we go from here? In many ways, we're just getting started. Remember the, the iceberg? Uh, just getting started. Um, and it's an evolution of reimagining, reimagining endodontics with multisonic debridement and disinfection. So. I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this world-class event. And uh, it's been my honor and a privilege. And I hope you enjoyed my presentation. We have some questions from the audience, Dr. Corey. First, earlier in your presentation, you spoke to why you would limit the use of Gentle Wave to certain clinical situations. Some that I have spoken to about their experience have chosen not to use it on vital cases. Can you provide your perspective on this philosophy? I think um, the perspective on the philosophy of not using it on vital cases comes from the fact that you don't have bacteria, necessarily bacteria. Um, you don't have infected lateral canals. Um, so the chance of being able to remove the canal contents and seal the canals successfully is higher. Although, I will tell you, uh, and, and we have case after case that tells us that we were able to run Gentle Wave on vital cases, we were able to pick up anatomy. So then you question, does anatomy matter? Well, anatomy only matters when it matters, right? So I've had cases before, and I think we all have, that we treated the case, it was textbook, it was vital, and the patient comes back two or three or four years later, and there's a little furcal lesion, or there's a little lesion to the mesial aspect of the lower molar root. You retreat it, and I have a case. It was on my referring doctor's wife. I did the initial treat it, treatment. 
I retreated it two years later, and then I retreated it four years later because she had symptoms again. And only when I used Gentle Wave was I able to obturate the lateral canal into the furcation where there was now a lesion. Had I done that in the beginning, would I have eliminated two retreatments? I don't know, but I'm going to probably put a little bit of money on that that I, I will. So when I don't use Gentle Wave for whatever reason, I wonder if I'm actually doing the best possible job I can for the patient. And that's an evolution. It's just the way it works. But you can't get there if you don't use it on every patient. If you only use it on occasional patients, you never know that, right? So it's just a part of what you, you know, it's, it's a philosophy. And you'll begin to, um, that philosophy will begin to sort of get a little bit more important and get bigger and bigger as you go. Thank you. What bond do you use? I just told you that it comes out of my brain to my assistant, so I'm not really sure. <laughs> what she hands you. Uh-huh. <laughs> I said what she hands you. Yeah, what she hands me. Yeah, I'm not really sure. It's, uh, <laughs> I really have no clue. I don't well, even we'll, know where she keeps it, so I couldn't even go look it up. We'll take this clinician's name. We can follow up later. Yeah. How much time do you estimate your average case is now with your new protocol and before Gentle Wave? Oh, before Gentle Wave? Before Gentle Wave, and um, they're saying also now with your new protocol of non instrumentation. Now, it, I'm, I'm a little bit quicker, but that's experiential um, because there's that learning curve that you have to allow yourself some time to, to you know, get acquainted with the technology and to understand it. I think part of it, um, if you're not used to, say, doing buildups for your referring doctors, I think there's a little bit more of a learning curve because you're doing something that you're not used to doing when you're using that sound seal. Um, just little things like that. But also, it's a commitment. That first week when we brought Gentle Wave in, we reduced our schedule, but we were committed to it. And I can tell you, we went home every night, you know, because you're gripping that baby, you got your handpiece over here and the foot pedal and every little little thing, you know, you're ready to lift up. You're on edge, you're on pins and needles. We'd go home, you know, it's like, oh my God, my neck is killing me. Everything, we're thinking, is this gonna be the way it is? And then the next experience, you, you ease off. So I think a little bit of it is, you gotta give yourself some time to master the technique and then once you do, then all of a sudden, that time comes way back, and then you're really back to your normal schedule. We're back to our, we were back to our normal schedule at day four of bringing Gentle Wave in because we were just committed to making it work. Um, Thank you. How many Gentle Wave cases have you had to go back and retreat? I've had three. Three. Do you want to talk about? The conditions of those three or? Um, one of them was a fracture case that the patient wanted to save. And then the other one was a case that it had a, it, it bifurcated, is a pre, lower premolar that bifurcated apically. And when we ran the gentle wave, I could not get an instrument in it. And when we ran the gentle wave, we sealed it nothing happened there was no and i used a squirt excess sealer nothing took place so i kind of came to the conclusion either there was a total occlusion of that space but yet beyond it there was still some bacteria this this tooth was necrotic and so i went in and i actually did surgery on that tooth because i just figured it was just an anatomical variation that the gentle wave just couldn't handle i mean it's not a panacea for everything anatomy is anatomy and not like I tell my patients sometimes, they'll say, well, why does my tooth look like that? I said, you know, God had a sense of humor when he made that tooth. That's all I can tell you. So everything is not going to be absolute. And it's, the other thing is, as I get questions, Gentle Wave's not a, a fix-all for, you know, poor endo. Um, you still have to do your part. You still have to find the canals. You still have to unroof the chamber. I mean, there's little things. And endodontists, we all know that to be true. But... Sometimes you, you, know, you surprise yourself and you think, well, I'm going to get a little lazy here. It's, n it's not a fix-all for lazy endodontics. Thank you. I want to call everyone's attention to the CE code at the bottom of your screen so you'll note the last four digits of your eight-digit code. Make sure that you take your CE surveys. So you can collect your CE credits. 
I also want to call your attention to our event survey. So that is at a banner at the bottom of your screen rotating through. Let us know how we're doing. Give us some feedback so we can adjust for future meetings. And we'll give it just one more second. Aha, another case has come through. How many Genowave cases total do you think you've done? Uh, we're probably um, 5,200 between my partner and I since uh, June of 2018. Fantastic. All right.